Hello, welcome to the Bush Lee Gaming Podcast, your source for ordinary opinions from ordinary gamers. Today, we are discussing consumer backlash in the video game industry with a special guest. I'm your host, Jacob Bush, and with me today, he smokes a pack of candy cigarettes a day, and he isn't fully convinced that armadillos are real. Your favorite crip boy, Nick Beard. <laughs> the candy cigarettes, that, that's false, but the armadillo, that-, that Have that you ever seen too. an armadillo in person? I'm just curious. I have, yeah. I have, yeah, in Texas. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, for just sure. I have the it. roads. So yep. you're not convinced. I've never seen an in-person armadillo. That's fair. They're rare. Conspiracy. That other voice you heard, when a server brings him his food at a restaurant and tells him, enjoy your food, he responds, you too. Every time. Leader of Nintendites, Ryan Scout. Every <laughs> time. I am so horribly awkward when it comes to interactions with strangers. It's also popcorn, uh, too. You. Like when, or not popcorn, but a movie. Like when they give you your ticket, and enjoy your movie. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you too. too. Well, you're, you're not coming with me. TSA. And yeah. I'm about to get on my flight or something like that. And they're like, enjoy your flight. And I'm just I've like, never had every time. that customer service oriented. <laughs> they're pretty polite in Phoenix. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, our special guest today is a gaming editor at GamesBeat. But more importantly, he is a world-renowned speedrunner, respecter of embargoes, Jeff Grubb. Thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. This is fun. Jeff, can you tell the people a little about what you do? So you obviously, I said, a, a gaming editor at Games Beat. Um, where can they find you? What else are you doing? Plug your podcast because I love all of them. Yeah, uh, I so I guess the best way to always find me is on Twitter. I tweet too much, so don't follow me on Twitter, but you could find me there if you want to like find stuff. Uh, but yeah, I tweet too much, and then... Uh, yeah, I do a, a few podcasts. Uh, we do Games Beat Decides. That one's on Friday lives, uh, live on YouTube. Uh, again, I'll, I'll post about it on my Twitter account if you want to like actually find this stuff. Uh, I also do How Games Make Money. Um, I started a YouTube show uh, called The Game Mess, Jeff, Jeff Grubb's Game Mess Live or whatever. I don't even, I don't even know the name yet. Uh, but it's just about like updating people about what's happening as uh, we go into a second year without an official E3 to wrap up all the events. I'm going to try to do my best to keep people on top of that stuff there. Um, I just started that in the last week and it's been going really well. It's been a lot of fun to do that. But, uh, but yeah. And then if you uh, ever want to catch my writing, I'm always writing about games, trying to help people understand, not just like, Oh, let's not just talk about the news. Let's not just necessarily regurgitate PR. Let's help people understand what's actually happening in games. And I do that on gamespeed.com. So uh, yeah. Thank you for the intro though. Yeah. And your uh, summer game was it summer games fest. Am I saying that right? Summer game mess. Oh yeah. Another mess. Guy does summer game fest. And we don't we, listen. We all know. What, <laughs> we all know what the real deal is. It's a mess and no, it's barely counts as a fest. So well, there, yeah. there was, there was a vacuum left and you obviously you're filling it well. Cause it's so hard to keep track of things. Like even if you are on Twitter and actively checking things, yeah. that's not one tweet that event coming up and i'm like oh square is doing something this week and like usually it's pretty uneventful but still i like to know when these things are coming up so i love sure. that you started doing that yeah big but help. it's it's i have an unfair advantage jeff Keeley is um trying to make it official and i'm just a reporter reporting stuff so jeff Keeley can't say oh this thing i heard this thing's gonna happen because he's trying to make these real deals to get people to say oh yeah we are actually part of summer game fest and if i hear something's happening and i can confirm it i just throw it on the list because it's just <laughs> information it's just data so yeah unfair advantage it. and i take advantage I, of it i love it and i also need to correct do follow jeff on twitter he doesn't miss and i mean this <laughs> jeff you tweet you say you tweet Thank a lot you. you do you don't miss like they Thank uh you. it's it's a perfect balance of comedy and then also inform information so jeff the topic you know i actually messaged you maybe this is probably back in january when microsoft was having their mm -hmm kind of gold issue. And I was like, hey, you know, could you come on and talk about this? And I was like, usually these things get rolled back, but I think it'd be fun to still like explore. Sure enough, 24 hours later, they they, they roll it back. Yeah, not even. And like, just for yeah. the listener's yeah, sake. It was like the same day. It, it, was, it was. And yep. like, for the listener's sake, just to explain what the situation was, Xbox basically doubled the price of gold for a year, right? Am I, am I characterizing that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they were going to basically, basically, if you were a new customer, if you were an existing customer, you could have got away with paying it. But yeah, that's, that's the gist. Exactly. Yeah. There's some nuance to it, but. Basically, there was a ton of consumer backlash on Twitter. And I want to say mainly Twitter. That's where I saw it at. And it resulted in them going back to what it was. And even saying, I think now, you know, games like Fortnite are going to be free on Xbox Gold. Is that correct? So like free to play games, they're actually reversing some of their, I'd say, archaic yeah. stances compared to the industry at this point. Yeah, yeah they, they announced that change when they made the reversal at that time. But they were always going to do that, and that was always going to come later this year. And then they just moved up the the time frame for that. I, I actually don't know if that's gone through yet, but if it has, okay. and it should happen here pretty soon. But yeah, yeah, that was that was a big move. It was just trying to get people to say, "Oh no, we actually aren't trying to like 
be unfair or, or raise prices on you. We're not trying to make you mad. Just please chill out. And we're, we're definitely not going to do this to Game Pass. That was the key thing. They were like, they thought people would assume if they're doing this Xbox Live, they're going to do it to Game Pass. And they're not going to do it to Game Pass. They don't want people even thinking that. So that they that's why they made the reversal. They will absolutely do it to Game Pass someday, though, right? There's uh, eventually. Oh, yeah, of course. Eventually right, down right, the road. Yeah. yeah, but it's not going to happen this year or anything like that. Not anytime soon. But and this is where like the the fact that this happened to Microsoft because we've had we've seen this happen to probably every publisher at this point or, or, or like on at least some small scales and large scales so like EA was a big one with Star Wars Battlefront 2. You can probably look at any month and there was probably the flavor of the month of the backlash that a publisher made a decision or a developer made a decision and somehow Twitter and the communities got mad and this one stood out to me because it's Xbox. Xbox has, has been building up goodwill, in my opinion, for the last like two or three years with Game Pass and some of the, the pro-consumer initiatives. And I say pro-consumer in air quotes because I do want to explore that a little bit more, but I, it just it shocked me when as fans and like, I need to explain my background a little bit. I am probably the, the one of the last people to complain from a consumer perspective. So like a restaurant could bring me the wrong dish that I ordered. And I usually be like, I guess I'm having fish tonight. Like, I guess it's okay. Because I've, I've, I've worked in food industry and like Same, cust- yep. customer service is just hard and I get it. So even See, that- I'm, a, I'm the opposite because as a Nintendo fan, I complain nonstop, but then right. I just eat the slop that's put in front of me. Like you do pig. both. Yeah. I'm part Pretty of the problem. Sure, yeah. right. Classic <laughs> Nintendo fan. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so like, a- I, I think it's shocking, at least for me, where Microsoft has been doing so much for fans, in my opinion. For a while now, really well. And for us too. to flip that quickly and be like, "Hey, don't do this." And the reason it shocked me even further is that Microsoft was like, "Yeah, we do deserve this. We do deserve this backlash." And like, I have a quote from their response uh, with a, a blog post. In quotes, "We messed up today, and you were right to let us know." And I read that and I go, "This is just the video." I, I think it's the video game industry more than other industries because if oh, Netflix, yeah. if Netflix up their price, we're gonna eat that. Like. We're going to be paying right. that. It, it, remember, do you remember Flickster though? They did do this and they're, they're like, they figured out how to like more gently do it, but they were going to switch to like make Flickster uh, the thing where that's where you get DVDs. And then Netflix was going to be just digital and it was going to go up in price. And they announced it and there was a big backlash then. This is years ago now. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, uh, but, but, but since then they've been able to like gently update the price a little bit more gradually and people are just eating it. So for the most part, you're right. And I agree with the, with the um, characterization that, this is mostly games. P- people in games, gaming fans are very loud. They let people know when, when they don't like something and it's, uh, it's hard to manage, right? I mean, yeah, I'll let you continue, continue your point, but I agree with it with that characterization. Well, and also, also, that's, that's why you're here, Jeff, because you know these historical things, not as much as we do. So, yeah. And it has to do with like the net that's cast, right? Because like Netflix now has so many families, like my yeah. parents are not going to complain when they raise the price. Yeah, very They'll good point. Complain privately but they don't even have social media, right? And so the net is wide enough now to where they could raise a price, people will freak out on Twitter, but it's it doesn't matter, it's gonna be right? They percentage. still have a ton of yep. subscriptions. And gaming yep. specifically, it's usually, I just think the gaming in- industry is saturated with people who like know what they want and are very active in that community, right? Yep. And it kind of requires that. And so that's why I feel like it. we really hit wallets when when we start complaining on twitter or you know anywhere on the internet really yeah and we uh yeah we talk to each other a lot and i think uh the idea that yeah the netflix cast a wider net is, is is a good point and gaming is still actually kind of like a small community uh at least yeah. uh, we, we we behave that way at least yeah. um if if a new story pops off everyone's talking about it and it's every podcast and every youtube channel is making a reaction to it and if it's a if it's a bad news story it's like that's People like to like buzz about that stuff and it does well on, on stuff like YouTube. So people are going to just keep making videos about it and keep people trying to keep people enraged about that. It gets more clicks. Absolutely. And so, yeah. And and so, yeah, uh, with these big companies trying to manage that, I mean, these are massive trillion dollar companies in the case of Microsoft having to foster a community that is so reactive, so loud. uh, It's a different beast than a lot of other uh, companies have to deal with like ford doesn't care if you're <laughs> upset that their cars are whatever like yeah the, the new car works worse than the old car they don't care they're not right. gonna listen to you My, microsoft they really want our money we spend a lot of money but gamers spend a lot of money and um if you upset the balance just a little bit uh we'll, we'll shut our wallets really quick and it'll be bad for your business and they saw that with the xbox one so they know they've learned their lesson yeah. and like this is where like my, obviously microsoft goes out of their way to to really make these pro-consumer changes or, or at least show that they're listening. And 
in some ways, when you contrast them to something like Nintendo, I mean, we joke about it, but for fans to, to really turn on you this quickly in this scenario, like we didn't give them 24 hours to, to even like put out a full statement on what's going on here. I don't know. Like, is it worth it even? Because if we are so quick to hold them to the fire in the sense, why even do it? Like, why, why did you build up these two or three years if we're going to, if you can lose it just like that? But yeah. So this is, this is a good question. And I think uh, the answer is, is like uh, gaming is like New York City. If you can make it in New York City, you can make it anywhere. If you can make it in gaming, you can make it anywhere. Yeah. I think you, like if you, if you have a business model, streaming video on the internet of uh, services, anything like that, if you can get the gamers on your side who are, Again, very loud, but they're also very, they, they are very good at scrutinizing products. I think this is why uh, Discord is so good compared to so many other, like other similar services. Um, it's because if you can make it good for gamers, gamers know exactly what they want. They'll tell you and they'll, and, they'll, and they'll be really loud about it. And if it's something like they like, they'll tell all their friends to use it too. And so if you can make it in gaming, you can apply this same technology, all these things that you are building up, all these services, you can apply, that, apply them to different areas. I think this is what, um, what Google thought they were going to do with Stadia, right? They were going to expand and, and subsidize the expansion of their server technology, their cloud technology, using gaming. And we were going to come up and we we're going to pay for all this stuff. And then they were going to spread it around the world and then use that server technology in other areas, uh, you know, use it to sell to businesses and make even more money from businesses. And what they found out really quick is gamers were, they were not meeting the needs of gamers and, the, and gamers were letting them know, and we weren't just going to pay for this. We weren't going to just say, oh, you're selling us games. Another way to buy games. We don't care. You have to meet this basic sort of level and get past that to even like sort of get us on your side in the first place. And it, it's, I mean, it's still a risk and it's challenging. But again, gamers spend a lot of money. So even if you yes. just get the gamers, it is a, a really good business. Now, to speak to Microsoft specifically, Microsoft isn't trying to just do with the gamers. They're, they're, they need the gamers as the base. Like we are going to be the, the foundation here, but they are uh, xCloud and all these other business models where they're going to the They always talk about, oh, there's 2 billion gamers out there. They see a blue ocean. They're trying to get to that. Whether or not they can make that leap is still, I think, up in the air. But that, that is their goal. Their goal is to have that cast that wider net like Netflix, and we'll see if they can actually get to that point. I want to probe that a little bit more because your, your ear's a little closer to the ground on this, right? You're seeing this on a daily basis. Do you see this, and correct me, but I don't see many other, this pro, you know, pro-consumer company at this scale doing as much for gamers than, than Microsoft. And obviously that's Game Pass, that's cloud gaming, all, all these initiatives. Do you see that paying off? Obviously, like Game Pass is an investment at this point, right? It's an investment for the future. It's, it's not going to be profitable for, I don't know how long until they change the price. But yeah. I, I just wonder, like, is it going to pay off being the good guy? I do see it like kind of like right now, Xbox is the good guy. They've earned it, that. They've I earned feel it. like they've done a lot for gamers uh, in the fact of just trying to onboard everyone they can. Because uh, I mean, I think about like my nephew, Game Pass is the greatest thing in the world to him, right? He just unlocked ooh. hundreds of games. And for a, especially a young gamer, that is, that is just opening so many doors for so many people. And so I feel like they have earned that title of like the good guy of the gaming industry. Like Sony's going to protect Sony customers, right? Like they're really good at like that. You know, right. they have their tribe and they will do everything for you, get you the exclusives, exclusives yeah. get you everything early. And then Xbox is like, yeah, we want just everyone and their grandmother like gaming. And so they're just going to put out anything they can to get everyone on board. And so I feel like to your point, like they've done a really good job of earning that. Is it? Yeah. Un- Jeff, like do you to the question, is this sustainable? Is it does it pay off, especially when goodwill, in my opinion, doesn't get you that far when you do make some mistakes, right? Yeah, uh, it's very, you're right. It's it's very easy to lose that goodwill. Um, I think that the, Microsoft has learned a lot of lessons and they've learned it the hard way. And I think we're, we're in a, a situation now where, and I, and I think they proved it. We started talking about that Xbox Live Gold price hike and within 24 hours, they addressed it. They reversed it. They uh, they explained how they messed up. And now no one no one talks about that anymore, and they've already forgiven them. They didn't give it air to tur- the, the air to breathe to turn into this raging fire that would work against them for the entire generation. They immediately nipped it in the bud because they learned their lesson. Um, and those are hard hard won lessons. And uh, at a certain point, you kind of want, want to be like, hey, we we do know how to speak to gamers now. Uh, why wouldn't we use this if, if we're like one of the few companies on earth who first has the money to do something like Game Pass and all these other things, uh, has the technology, 
with with our cloud infrastructure um, can help can make hardware. We, we're like one of the few companies on earth that has all of these core competencies to make a console, to make a gaming business work. So why wouldn't we do it at a certain point? But I think that the long-term proposition here uh, for Microsoft is absolutely, I think they absolutely see the potential of disrupting this business to the point where a Netflix of games seems inevitable. It has happened to every other entertainment sort of consumption media genre. Uh, you can, you, uh, people no longer buy CDs, they go to Spotify. People no longer buy movies, they go to Netflix. And eventually in five, 10 years, uh, you know, probably somewhere in that time frame, it's going to be pretty wild to most people, the idea of buying a video game. You're yeah. just going to, you're just going to download it or stream it from a service, just like you do any of these other things. And Microsoft is well positioned to, to, to tackle that. I, I think, I think when Phil Spencer, when Satya Nadella took over Microsoft and wasn't sure about games, I think Phil Spencer very carefully explained that notion. The, like, we've seen this happen to other industries. We are in a position where we can actually do that more than anyone else, more than Sony, more than Google or Amazon or even Tencent. We could do this. So if we get out ahead of everybody and establish ourselves as, you know, Game Pass first, we could own that. And I, I, if they do, if that, if that actually works out, if it pans out, and I think it's likely to at least be one of the ways that people play games going forward, without a doubt. I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably never going to cancel my Game Pass subscription. I can't imagine I would. And yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, but and, and as new people come in, you talk about like grandmas and stuff. But like as anyone new comes into gaming, like kind of why wouldn't you try Game Pass at the very least? Try it. Yeah. Um, I, right. I think they are going to capitalize on this and I think it's going to work out really well. It doesn't mean that Sony necessarily has to like respond or try the same thing. But they, they, they might have to if the if the business model changes so as as radically as it has for you know home video, yeah, uh, yeah they might have to. Uh, and but it's, so that, that that and that disruption is what Microsoft is counting on, absolutely. Yeah, and like I don't know if Sony even has to compete because this is the first generation where I really feel like there are three distinct categories for a gamer, yeah. and like you can occupy both of all three very cheaply. Like you can buy a two hundred dollar Nintendo Switch Lite. You can get $15 Game Pass and have a computer and play it through there or get a cheap, you know, uh, Xbox Series S, or you can go with the whole, you know, Sony and get the exclusives. Like, I think they're all doing different things at this point where, you know, you don't have to shill out the, the big bucks to, to have all three consoles anymore. Like as a kid, I remember, oh, let's go to his house. He's got, he's got the GameCube, the PS2 and, you know, the Xbox. Like that was a, a big deal. And I don't think it's as, as hard to achieve anymore, right? So I don't know. And, and Jeff, I want to clarify. So is that due to their cash? Is that just because Microsoft's positioned with how much they have just to fund something like this? Uh, that's, that is a huge part of it. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, when we talk about like, how do you make this? Like, so the movie industry is set up with, a, there's a bunch of studios that make movies and then they sell them to distributors and they sell them to, to you know, the bigger film studios and stuff like that. Um, but they always have a, a labor force that is unionized and prepared and ready to go from, from studio to studio and studio. And, and, and so it is made to work in a way that is sort of decentralized. Uh, gaming doesn't have the same, you know, union, unionization. So you have to buy the studios yourself to like make sure that you have enough uh, content to go on the platform. And the one company that, un that understands that right now is Microsoft. We see this with the Bethesda acquisition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we see it with Tencent as well. Tencent gets it as well. They're, they're making, they are putting a lot of money in a lot of different video game studios. I guess even Embracer gets it. Embracer Group, that, that company in Europe that keeps buying companies. Yep. But you have, you have to actually buy the studio. You have to do it all yourself. It's very expensive. And yeah, Microsoft has just a, a ton of money they have so much money it's really hard to fathom how much money they have um i think they <laughs> like they bring in seven to ten billion dollars like it churns through their system each week so a bethesda a week basically is, is how much insane. cash flow they have and when you have that much money sitting in the bank at any one time it really is burning a hole in your pocket especially these days with um really low interest rates and with the the specter of inflation, inflation. Uh, it's, yeah that if that money is is worth less it's it really it really is burning a hole in their pocket they hate that yeah. uh, they hate having to just sit there doing nothing so why wouldn't they go out and buy some studios and um and yeah and Try but not like sony sony's not in that position sony doesn't have that kind of money laying around they they just cannot compete on and on on that battlefield and they're not planning to they don't even want to they're going to try to keep doing it the way they've, that sony playstation has worked for decades and that's been fine it's likely going to continue to be fine for quite some time but it's not just about the cash there are uh azure cloud blades uh regional serve like probably down your street there is a microsoft server farm 
somewhere, uh, not, not too far away from your home. And that's true for most people in North America, in Europe, and throughout Asia, and probably pretty soon Australia and Africa and South America. <laughs> and, and it's gonna, yeah, that is a, a big, that's a big change. And uh, that takes a lot of money. And, uh, and, and also takes a lot of like technical know-how. And again, Microsoft, one of the few, co- Google could do this too, if they knew how to do the gaming side. They don't yeah. know how to do the gaming business. Um, Amazon could do this. Amazon has a, even a bigger, an, a bigger cloud infrastructure than Microsoft uh, with, with you know, more advanced technology than Microsoft. But again, don't know how to do the gaming business side. A very difficult business to like crack into, at, especially more now than ever. When Microsoft and Sony came into gaming at that time, you could make a game for $5 million at the most. Like that was a big budget game back then. And now it's 50, $100 million, 150, $200 million for some of these Sony games. So it is a, a number of factors. Games are more expensive, more difficult to make than ever. Microsoft's been doing it for a really long time. They have the expertise. Cloud infrastructure uh, is difficult, expensive. Microsoft's already been doing it. Um, and then having the cash to buy the content, Microsoft has that. So it's just these, yeah. these, these three big pillars that enable Microsoft to compete. And to disrupt the industry, it's already in. Most companies that want to disrupt stuff are startups. They, don't, they aren't companies that exist. It's not companies that have already established a business. Um, but Microsoft has done it before when they, when they moved from like selling Windows as a product to, to becoming a services company and basically selling services. They totally shifted in a way that few companies ever have successfully done. And they think they could do it again with games. And that might be like the fourth side of this, where they know how to shift their business model. And uh, almost no other company, at least no other company of that size knows how to do that. So there's just a lot of factors working in Microsoft's favor here. I think those are really good points. And I think we're seeing kind of a divergence because if Microsoft wanted to, they, like you said, they have the money to make incredible hardware, right? I feel like they could have blown the PS5 out of the water, but it almost feels like they're trying to get out of that hardware game because they're a software company, yeah. right? And so it's like, if, if they don't do the Netflix of games, who will? And then Sony is just going to like, they know their place. They're going to double down on like really good hardware, the PSVR 2 that we're eventually going to see. Um, they're always coming out with like these little like creative things, creative ways to play on their devices. And that's just what Sony does. They're going to own that. Mm-hmm. And they tell stories with their games. And then you have Nintendo, which is like the Disney of video gaming, right? They have like yeah. this, this world that you buy into, you believe in, you want to be a part of. So similar to Disney, they're going to charge you literally whatever they want and you're going to pay for it because, you know, <laughs> your, your kids or you growing up, like have all these experiences with those characters and you want more about it. So it's like, I think you're totally right. The, there's really no other option for Xbox, right? They're not going to be the Disney of games and they're not going to be the master of hardware. So own this cloud service. Yeah, and I think something to be said too about, uh, you know, Mark Horowitz said it, that if it can be digitized, it will. And so I think we're seeing that, like you mentioned, across all industries. And there's something to be said too about, you know, first mover advantage, kind of a a marketing term. But if Microsoft can position themselves to be this, you know, the Netflix of gaming first, I think that's going to even kind of magnify and, and that's going to be a snowball effect for their future success in this industry as well. And so I think it's going to be a big thing for them if they can get there. Yeah. If, if people complain that like oh, in the same way that when uh, something isn't on Netflix, people can complain. If something isn't on Game Pass, people are going to start complaining here in the next year or so. Yeah. And, uh, and that's going to be a huge advantage for Microsoft. Yeah. And they obviously mm-hmm. listen too, and like, Ryan brings up Nintendo and that's, I think it's one of the things I I emailed you about too, but the contrast of Nintendo and Microsoft is becoming more and more stark from like this PR perspective, right? So Jeff, you, one of the first things in my interactions I had with you was on Twitter. When you wrote the article, this was on Games Beat, Super Mario 3D All-Stars is Nintendo at its worst. And I, I think top to bottom, this is an essential read for understanding. Very kind of good this, article. Yeah. yeah. And to understanding this, this big picture. So I'm, I'm going to read some quotes here and we can dig into them. But the first of which I just love this from a kind of a creator's perspective. So obviously we, we, we put out a podcast and we write and stuff and you, and you do similar stuff at a much higher level. But <laughs> you said in there, having standards is detrimental to your income. But if we can make that decision, so can Nintendo. So this was along the lines of basically they will just go right after the wallet and sacrifice kind of standards, right? Shamelessly. And, and Super Mario 3D All-Stars is an example of that. 
And I just love that. Again, that's kind of, in my opinion, a little inspirational and kind of confirms our approach because we could do clickbait all day and I could get more page views and all this and whatever. But like, I don't want to, I'm not going to sleep at night about that. Like I don't, the the dollar isn't what we're in it for. So uh, I just wanted to point that out within the article, but the the big quote that I want to read here. So the fundamental problem is that Nintendo knows what it can get away with. It can do the bare minimum and get and get away with it. And I don't know if it will ever really pay a price for that. It hasn't so far, and it's only selling more games and consoles as the Switch matures. So I guess I'm writing this to politely ask the company to do better in the future, even though it doesn't have to. That summarizes, I think, Nintendo's fans like plea these days. And it's a plea because they, they mm-hmm. don't need to change, right? I mean, you say it in your article. They, they've been doing it and successful. The Switch is one of the greatest successes and it's going to continue to be a success. So like, I, I'm curious, like, how do you see, obviously, you, you, you see that there's a problem here. It's one of the only companies that can get away with it. Why do we not hold Nintendo to the same standard that we just went after Microsoft for? Uh, yeah, and uh, th- it's just because, um, you know, it really is the Disney factor. Uh, that these are, these are a pair of companies in Disney and Nintendo that people imagine as these sort of fantasy lands where magical creatures make these games and they deliver them to them. Uh, th- they deliver these games to us as children and we identify with them and associate our, our youth with them. And it's, it's not even just nostalgia. It is just, it is identity. You know, if, you, if you're, if you're a Nintendo fan, you are a Nintendo fan in a, in a slightly different way than a PlayStation or Microsoft Xbox yeah. fan is, is a fan of those things. It is um a, a little bit more core to your being. And uh, it's, it's not, better it's not it's not doesn't make uh, it doesn't make you a better fan of nintendo or something like that it's it's just in, inextricable and to the point where this is it's part of their success absolutely where uh, when people grow up and become creative people and they become some of the best creative people in their fields so like well i i do want to go animate for disney and i do want to go develop games for nintendo because i that's that's what i grew up playing and i want to continue making games and making making sure that the best games come out of these places it's you know it's the stories they tell but not just the the stories within their games or or within their movies when it comes to disney it's the stories that they tell about themselves you know you you want to get getting up on stage and saying you know i am a gamer at gdc in like 2003 or whatever it was you know you, you believe that these companies are are ran by people who actually really truly love this stuff um in a way that you see jim ryan talk about playstation and he doesn't. He doesn't love PlayStation in the same way you want to love Nintendo. At least that's the story I tell myself. And that's what they, and it's very deliberate that I tell myself that's that story. Nintendo wants me to think that way. All these things sort of work together to make it feel like this sort of magical creature factory. And it's very hard to pull that stuff apart and, and, and assess it critically, especially when you just, once you're playing the game, it all sort of goes out the window and you forget about it all. You're like, I actually am just playing Mario 64 now on the, the 3D All-Stars game. And yeah, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm upset about this package, but boy, this game stole just a lot of fun for me. And yeah. when, they're just better at, when they're just better at everyone else than making games, they really, it's, it, a lot of it just comes down to that. I just wanted to play their games more than any, like anyone else making games. And so, yeah, please change, please. But also I get that you're not going to. <laughs> I love the Disney analogy because yeah. we've got Jacob over here who is a diehard Disney fan. I mean, Disneyland every year and yeah. Ryan over here who has sold his soul in Nintendo. And so uh, that, that description <laughs> I, of him a big as part Nintendo, of the problem. Yeah, yeah, that description oh, yeah. resonates. Same. But I think that's a really good point about, uh, you know, it's almost like this identity that we grew up with. Yeah. There's this nostalgia and it's got a deeper root planted in us you know the disney's and the nintendo's and that's fascinating i don't know why i've never really looked at it like that i wonder if i also wonder like as a nintendo fan i'm going to complain all year because they're gonna like (laughs) they're just gonna put out these you know 3d all stars or skyward sword full price price. it's just you know a little better resolution and so i'm just gonna complain and i'm probably gonna buy like most of the stuff they put out still and then they have these Mm -hmm. like transcending generation type games like i think of breath of the wild right yeah they make one game and for like five years it doesn't matter what nintendo does they made breath of the wild you know what i mean like i'm hoping maybe metroid prime 4 will be that for us one day probably (laughs) not but i just (laughs) think like nintendo has this way of like making these kind of as you said these magical games that literally transcend generations and so maybe maybe it is the fact that if they put all that focus into these games and do that so well maybe we should just look at them as like being a a developer of like every five years just this incredible game and everything else is bonus 
yeah i think even if you like just like look like if microsoft when microsoft makes a good game usually it's like okay it's it's it's, it's pretty good it's like a solid game but you, you could tell that they um it was uh, sometimes it feels like a fluke a little bit like they're that a lot of their games come out and they just are kind of b-level uh in kind of 70 80 on metacritic that sort of thing yeah. um and so when they come in, come up with a good game it's like oh it's it's a, yeah it's a 90 but it's not like uh rarely are they in the talk for greatest game of all time sony when sony makes a great game it you could tell that it came just from them spending more money on it than anyone's ever spent on a, on a game before it is so slick and so polished and so produced and and, and they just put more they threw more people and more resources at it than anyone in history has ever thrown at a video game and so yeah it's all all that, that stuff shows up on screen and that's great but you sort of like you see the process like you just you see the bank account being applied and uh with nintendo it is a very much like breath of the wild yeah i get it it was probably pretty expensive to make but it's there's no way it costs as much as some of these other games from like sony god and of war. yeah 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 it's no way it, no there's no way it probably is like half the price of god of war if that yeah and it's like so is it just like they're just more creative and isn't that just somehow better isn't that just like what we want here it's like they are better at these intangible things that we sort that we seem to value more or that we uh like the degree of difficulty points that we apply when we are uh, trying to assess the value of a game that we're playing um but i i i agree like breath of the wild comes out and it's like this is the first game to make me feel this way since i was a child how did i'm like 30 some odd years old how did they do this this is yeah uh, they shouldn't be able to do this no one's been able to do it since i was a kid i thought it was just like oh a part of me you know had matured and grown up and i'm like just assessing these things like on a on an even keel and then i, I play this and i'm like crying because it's so good um <laughs> right it, it, if, if a company's able to do that they, they get away with a lot more and Indeed. if and I, I just and it's like the difference is is like sony and microsoft just aren't as good as me ma- and making games it's really is the kind of the the well, biggest difference well and like mm-hmm. I, I brought up goodwill right and it's a it's if you look at the business term right it's it's basically assets that aren't tangible you know that that's ip that's um, customer stance. So like, you know, we talk about, I, I'm praising Xbox over here saying that Xbox has this goodwill with consumers and Nintendo just has a different form of goodwill when you talk about intangible yeah. assets. Like it's, they have this Disney factor, they have our nostalgia, they have us hooked. So I, I'm kind of shooting down my own point of like Nintendo doesn't really care about goodwill. No, they, they care about it. It's just a completely different type. So I don't know, it's fascinating because you look at these companies both doing amazing things for consumers, but just in different ways. And like, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. We're constantly disappointed by a lot of Nintendo's decisions. And then they blow us out of the water and we talk about, you know, the next Breath of the Wild for three years after. So uh, do you see a change? Do you see them change? Do they, like, do they need to change? Like, that, that's kind of what I'm stuck on is how do we as consumers, you know, at least with Microsoft, you get on Twitter and you're super loud. And that's how you get change with Microsoft. How do we as Nintendo fans get change other than don't buy the Wii U, right? Like that was change. Which I still yeah. buy. So, <laughs> yeah, same, yeah. Uh, it, it, so I, I think it's a good, I think you made a good distinction there. Like um, the, the goodwill that Nintendo is creating, they, they are caretakers of our, of our memories and our nostalgia and our youth and uh, caretakers of, of a fundamental belief in game design, a fundamental belief in mechanics and, and, and the, the link between the player and the controller and the software on the, on the screen. Um, and, and, all, and by, by caretaking these things, uh, they are valuing something that we as gaming fans really, really value a lot. And, so, and I think that's what people respond to. Um, Microsoft's way, the, 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 the difference is Microsoft seems to be trying to caretake our, our wallets and our anxiety about spending money on games, which is an, another thing that we deeply care about as gaming fans, where uh, we want to try a lot of different stuff, uh, but we end up finding ourselves in a rut or looking for the next sequel because I like that last game and I don't want to take a risk spending $60 on something that might not be good. So even though this game seems like it's okay, I'm just going to wait for a sequel to something I know I already like uh, because it's a lot of money. And if it, yeah. if it goes bad, I'm gonna either going to have to figure out how to sell that game to get my money back or I bought it digitally and I messed up and I have to wait for a sale. And that, that, that's, there's anxieties involved with that. And just having, just having a subscription where a bunch of games just get delivered to you in a bunch of different games. And, and some of them are good, some of them are great, but some of them are different. And it's like really cool to like realize, oh, I like a different kind of genre. Um, that stuff is... That is that is sort of caretaking us in in a in a very much a, a fiscal way, and we we uh, we do like that as well. Now, when we like com- like yeah, Microsoft changed, but Microsoft changed because they saw an opportunity. Um, yeah. And does does Nintendo see an opportunity to like that would force it to change? That's the difference. There's no 
Now, I, I think Nintendo realizes that <laughs> if they keep doing business the exact way they keep, they've, they've been doing it, they're just going to keep making more money. And, the, and the, the real thing is they did see the opportunity years and years ago by appealing to people who Sony and Microsoft don't appeal to, families, kids, uh, people who are um, looking to have sort of local cooperative fun experiences with stuff like Mario Party. Even if the Mario Party isn't great, there's still like this, this character-based fun game that you can play with your family and friends uh, and it's like lightweight and stuff like that. And they'll deliver that and sell 15 million copies of that game. Th th and yeah, that Blue Ocean strategy, that was the opportunity they saw. And they're going to keep going down that in that direction, aiming at an audience that that is not necessarily appealed to by the other companies. And they're going to just keep succeeding because those that audience is just going to keep growing. The family, the family segment is just going to keep spending more and more money on games. And Nintendo is going to dominate that for a long time. So uh, the opportunity to change isn't going to appear to them out of nowhere. Uh, I don't think. And so I would be very surprised if they tried to make any shifts in the way that they do their business for sure. Yeah. Mm. I'm just kind of fleshing some of this out in my mind as we talk about it. And when you look at that, when you take that caretaker lens that Nintendo uses, you know, and fostering our memories and, and these, these characters that we've grown up with in a family sense, that $60 for a scarce asset looks a lot different. Like, am I going to pay 60 bucks for something that I, that, that was kind of, you know, half done? Well, yeah, maybe I am because my I'm going to play with my family and it's nostalgic and it's worth more than a $60 game that's scarce that I didn't play when I was a kid. And so it's interesting to think about them as caretakers yeah, and, and using that lens on some of their decisions. Not that it, that it justifies it or makes it better or anything, but uh, it's, no, it's, it's no, fascinating. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Normally, I agree. normally I, I never really let Nintendo off the hook normally and, it, no. and maybe I'm, I'm toxic in that way, but um, <laughs> your, your intro is leader of the Nintendites. Yeah, so that's like, you. I hold mm. them accountable, but yeah, you, gotta... you know, if we take Nintendo out of this equation, it, I almost feel like there is no goodwill, right? So if EA makes Battlefront two and it's a hundred sure. million dollars, and we're like, we look at that and we're like, this is what you gave us for a hundred million dollars. You're gonna milk us for more money. Nintendo made a twenty million dollar game that literally <laughs> me and any kid could pick up at any moment and have hundreds of hours of enjoyment out of. And I mean, it's like this stark comparison and, and they've really created that sense, right? Yeah. So I normally like, I go after Nintendo all the time because I'm just like, some of the decisions they make, I just kind of what you alluded to in your article is why didn't they remaster it? Or why didn't they like add a new edge to this invert, game that I love? Camera off. At least yeah, just know. like, yeah. The very least. yes, silly things like that. You just kind of scratch your head. But at the same time, like the hole that Nintendo fills is it's an art to them. Kind of like you said, like they love this art, right? And so they're, they're making these games where it it's, creates that sense of goodwill in customers where we will not accept if you're going to spend a hundred millions on a hundred million on this game, it better be perfect, right? Like it better yeah. be a God of War tier game. And when it's not, we're just going to be unhappy because I don't want to spend this money. I will spend that money on 3D All Stars because I know <laughs> I know the time I will get out of it, right? Yeah, I, you know, it, it's this is a it's it's a good point that uh, Nintendo seems to believe in games, and this is something I I think I've repeated a bunch on my shows and stuff. Uh, but a lot of these other companies, I mean, you bring, bring up EA and uh, you can point to Activision and a, a, lot, a lot of others, but Activision yeah. and EA are, are especially guilty. But Microsoft was guilty this last generation of not believing that games were the answer to their problems. They yeah. looked to services. They looked to uh, when you're when you're when it was Xbox, they looked to TV and they said TV 50 times during a, a you know their their Xbox One reveal, and that was going to be their saving grace. Um, and never did Nintendo not believe that making good games like wasn't going to work. They always thought that, and that's mm. a huge difference. It's a, it's a it's a mammoth difference because like you look at a company like EA, they just have basically you know when Mirror Edge when Mirror's Edge two didn't work out, Mirror's Edge two is, is the is really the one that kind of broke their back there. Um, when that sort of came out and it was like generally well received, and then it didn't sell you know seven eight million copies or whatever, they were like we're just not going to do this anymore. We are just going to invest very specifically in live service games that can last for a really long time and are low risk and high reward if they pay off and and making just fundamentally good games isn't what we're interested in anymore that's not the business we're even in anymore and as gamers we can sense this we sense yeah. when a company doesn't seem to believe in games we we you know we look at Bobby Kotick at over at Activision 
And we could just sense he doesn't care about this business. He doesn't care. Well, he doesn't care about the, the processes of making good games. And and so we have sort of, we're alienated by that. And fairly so, I think, in a lot of cases. Because if they if they just sort of, ha- I mean, you're, they're not going to be Nintendo. I get that. And it's very hard to be Nintendo. I, I, I fully understand that. But if you s- seem to just, believe in games and try to make games that that, to deliver to that audience and eventually it feels like if you just keep getting better at it you will find a way to continue to appeal to that audience and we will sense that and there was that period where ea was doing that with stuff like the original mirror's edge and a a few other games that syndicate game and and a lot of yeah let them come out and they and they fizzle and i get that those are big risks and that's why they 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 you know they hedge away hedge away from these things but the alternative was not to sort of just get so afraid of making a video game that you barely actually do that that was not the answer and every single other one all these other companies decided that at the same time and that's why like the mid-tier video games just disappeared we just get the occasional known blockbuster and then service games and that's it yeah Yeah. and Mm. you get a lot of like it's just this it's pendulum shifting right you have um let's say ea make a decision or what was it with um what dragon age is going to be solely a single player game did it wasn't going to have some multiplayer elements originally now it's yeah it's that was that was the rumor but that was i don't necessarily buy that that much (laughs) actually but but yes that was the i i think shry reported like oh because of um the success of star wars jedi fallen order uh ea is fully behind the idea of making drag age for a single player rpg and the reality was that bioware was always kind of looking at all kinds of different ideas yeah but but they decided to make a single player rpg because that was like a realistic scope and yeah. they that was like realistic within their budgets and stuff like that but but yes i, I get what you're saying like uh the, it does seem to be swinging back because of something like when, when they get a hit when they get a hit like star wars jedi fall in order like oh this can work and now we believe in this again and i absolutely i absolutely buy the idea that the executives are on board with that more than they were before star wars jedi fall in order well and, yeah. and ea EA is a great example of this because they they have done smaller games that are necessarily as profitable as like a fifa right so like you have right. the unravels. Oh no, that was, I'm sorry. Was that Ubisoft? No, no, that's that's EA, the EA Originals. Yeah. So, so you have a... you have something like Unravel, and then you have a Joseph Ferris game. Uh, it takes two, and like mm-hmm. this is a prime example of someone who is thrown into the EA ecosystem. And like you have actually have it here because I I was I thought this might come up, but passionate guy Joseph Ferris, an electronic arts partner, says the publisher f's up sometimes. That whole <laughs> that whole article is from 2017. You wrote, and it's very true to the idea. Of like I think the underlying theme of what we're talking about here is this kind of goodwill. And like if a public or if a developer comes in with goodwill and they go into a publisher that maybe doesn't have goodwill, like they have to sit there and defend their decision. Like that's what he's, he's sitting here defending. Like, yeah, sometimes they do bad things, but they've been good to me. Like you shouldn't have to say that necessarily about the, the company you should be excited to be partnering with. Right. But like EA makes decisions that, that warrant those responses. Right. And again, we're just, gamers are very savvy. We see, we see the motivations. We see what you're trying to do. We see EA spending more money trying to come up with creative ways to separate us from even more money. That's where their, their incentives were. That's where their focus was. And it wasn't on making very good games. And so we give them, we, we you know, elect them the worst company in the world or whatever. You <laughs> yeah. come in the United States like three <laughs> years in a row <laughs> <We did>. uh, <laughs> because we're very loud and we, we vote on online polls. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's wild. But, but at a certain point, it's like these companies just sort of, you know, that the, they, created that situation themselves because they they did ignore games in a a really sort of uh, atrocious way that it's like if i was running these companies i would have been like what are we doing but you know i i wasn't and i get that they answered the shareholders who uh did see the potential of service games and i i still think like service games are are valuable but i think that ea the shift at ea that you spotlighted is the correct direction they have a they have a developer like respawn that has the way of making games where they prototype and they prototype and they prototype and eventually they're like okay we have a bunch of really great prototypes. Uh, now we need to productize. We have to take these prototypes and turn them into products. Let's do that now. And let's spend the, the second half of our development cycle doing that. And it is all led by creative people. It's all led by people who have a ton of experience making games. And what they come up with is Apex Legends and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. And it is it's so distinct from the way that EA had been running beforehand, where it was just yep. like, okay, we need another battlefield. We need another battlefield. Just make the next battlefield. Yeah. Um, and and so EA seeing that 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 works and saying we are going to apply this developer creative led model across all of our development teams is really important. It's worth noting. We'll see how it works out for them. We'll see whether or not they truly stick to that stick to that. But 
it seems like the correct model to me where sometimes these companies are going to want to make the big live service game like Apex Legends. It's just going to be like what fits their prototypes. A lot of them probably are playing live service games. A lot of developers love stuff like Destiny and Dota and stuff like that. And so when they start prototyping something, they'll come up with something that might work really well as a live service game. And if that's what fits, let them make that. But if what they come up with is just a really good single player experience, find a way to make that work too. Uh, and make those, and let these people who are super creative make games for people who love games. Yeah. And I think you will be in a much better position uh, in terms of that goodwill, but even financially than, than what you have been. Because I think a lot of, in a lot of cases, like companies like EA and Activision, their stock prices have gone up quite a bit. But a lot of it's built on the continuing existence of FIFA Ultimate Team and, yeah. and microtransactions in one or two games that, are, that is working very well. And if that stuff ever blows up or if a competitor comes in, like NBA 2K for like take two. NBA 2K is, is massive. It sells a lot and it has a lot of microtransactions and they, and they sell really well. But if EA ever figured out basketball and came in with like a free to play basketball game to compete with that, because like they're mad at take two taking this business <laughs> away from them, um, like that could totally throw take two off. And then that's a huge thing, a huge revenue source that's just gone. You have to keep coming up with what's next. And these companies are really bad at that right now. Actually, that's the problem. And EA has spotted a potential solution. And I think I think it's the right one. Yeah. Mm, I agree. Yeah, it's it's that weird uh, balance of the word. I, and I've thrown it around. I've, I've quoted about the term pro consumer. Uh, you hear it a lot, especially in the context of Microsoft. But you brought up shareholders. Right. And at the end of the day, yeah. these publicly traded companies are beholden to their shareholders. They're not, yeah. they're not they're not necessarily pro consumer. They're, they're pro shareholder. They're not mutually yeah. exclusive, though, either. So, like, you can do both. It's this fine line of walk, you know. You go too far, you're pro, you're pro shareholder, and then you have to walk it back a little bit to get back into that pro consumer spectrum. And like, we just see it. It's, it's almost exhausting to, to me. That's why like, I say I'm not much of a complainer when it comes to things because it's, oh, you know, someone else will complain because they do like video game community does complain yeah. and like <laughs> we get stuff done. But like, I do think the term pro consumer needs to be, you know, an asterisk to it, right? Because it's the, perce the perception of pro consumer because right. the second you start becoming anti-shareholder that's going to go away right you're going to go away you're going to go <laughs> away. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so i i think this is um like pro consumers are like a term i, I will very rarely ever use or yeah. write or say uh because it, it is just it is a um it comes from the consumer side right we're the ones that manifest like what is pro consumer and what's not and um if it's something we don't like that's what's pro that's what's anti-consumer uh or, or whatever but i i, I always think it is um if, if you think something's pro-consumer, you're probably being manipulated. Uh, and and <laughs> the, the example I use is, is um, the, the example I use is JCPenney. When, that, when the guy that ran the Apple store came up with the idea for the Apple store, went to JCPenney, he was like, we are going to make this, we're going to simplify prices. Everyone's going to fully understand exactly what's going on. As soon as you walk in the store, if you see a certain color tag, you know that's just going to be $8. No, no, no $7.99, just $8. Come on in. And, and no coupons, no sales. You're just, we're just going to give you a fair price right out of the gate. And consumers hated it. What consumers like is to feel like they are getting one over on, on the retailer. They like the idea of, oh, I found a coupon that no one else knows about, and I'm only going to come in on a sale, and I'm going to double up that coupon on the sale price, and then I'm going to get it for $8. And they don't realize they could have just got it for $8 had they walked in <laughs> on the other their model. They, just, they, think, they think psychologically that they are getting one over on the retailer. And if the retailer can make a customer feel like they are getting one over on them, without sort of like acknowledging that that's the thing that's really happening here. You can build this like really loyal following. That's like, man, I like shopping there. Cause I usually come out on top and it's <laughs> like, Oh no, you're being manipulated. Um, and, and whatever human, the, the human brain really likes this sort of thing. And that's absolutely at play with, with game pass. We, yes, we feel yes. like, we're, Oh my God, I got game pass for three years for, or for $1. They just gave it to me for one dollar. No one ever says that they just went out and bought one hundred eighty dollars worth of Xbox Live Gold right before that to right. get that through. They only, they only say the one dollar part because they think they're getting one over on Microsoft. Yeah. That was it me, is, man. Yeah. No one ever you says it. It's, it's so, so wild. It's so it's so it's like we're uh, absolutely being manipulated, and uh, it's like um okay, so is that is that bad? Well, yeah, being manipulated is bad, but like. Everyone is trying to manipulate everyone all the time. That's what marketing yeah. is. That's what, uh, you know, you, you try to get the best price in any haggling situation. You are trying to get the best thing for you. And that's the system we set up. And we can examine that system and we should. 
uh, but but we, but we all exist within that system right now. And so at, at a certain point, when you are just talking about pro-consumer, you are almost always just talking about that, uh, that someone exploiting that system really well. And so maybe uh, just look one step further and instead try to, sit, try to see the ramifications uh, and look at the other people involved in the, in the transaction. Um, do developers seem pretty happy with putting games on Game Pass? Well, a lot of them put a game on Game Pass and now they're putting a second game on Game Pass. Yeah, that seems yeah. like a good sign to me. Um, are more people playing games? Like, is it bringing in more customers? Yeah, it's, it seems like a lot of people are, are getting, they're at least trying more games than ever before. And there seems to be like a network effect where, if someone subscri- yeah. if someone is subscribing to Game Pass, they they tell their friends, and their friends like, oh yeah, I guess I could play more games with my friends if we all got Game Pass. And then now we have a regular group of, of people that play games every night, and so a new game comes out, and we want to buy that game. We're actually all going to spend sixty dollars on the game when we never would have before because everyone this just having your friends together in this network is is yeah. really powerful. It's this powerful tool to sell games. Um, to me, those are all like positive signs of the business working well, like the business model, like feeding in on itself and giving people experiences that they want. And whether or not it's pro or anti-consumer, it's just like at the end of the day, it's all just business. It's all just transactions. And yep. uh, if we if we feel good about it, yeah, that's that's good for the for the companies. But really, it's just a matter of like, what what are you getting out of it, really? Um, and that's what we should be examining instead. No, I love that. <laughs> yeah, babe, I spent one dollar. Uh, then why is the account one hundred and eighty one dollars negative? <laughs> hey, listen, I hear I hear what you're Incredible. saying, but I don't know if you've ever been to Kohl's, man. I compound those coupons and I <laughs> I make a cool Kohl's thing. cash, man. Kohl's cash. Kohl's, cash. I got Kohl's tattooed they, on my left leg. I, I own them. <laughs> do they do they even know how much Kohl's cash they're sending? I mean, there's, there must be some mistake here. <laughs> yeah, they're going under. You got idiots. They lose them. money on me for sure. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Jeff, that kind of rounds it out. I think that's a good ending point because yeah, it, it kind of it does bring everything together in the sense of what is backlash why does it why does it work so well in the gaming industry what is what does goodwill mean here as well and i don't know i just appreciate your insight so did you have anything else guys yeah i'm just curious this is kind of a broad question so however you want to answer it i i'm curious sure. what are you most excited about for like the future of gaming when we're talking about all these decisions that are made in the directions companies have pivoted is there anything that like stands out to you that you that really gets you excited for just the future of like something that you're excited that your kids will get to experience as far as gaming yeah I, it's going to be boring because we talked a lot about about a lot about it this episode but i i really do think what microsoft is doing is very exciting because it seems like they want to pay for the creation of a lot of video games. And I want to play a lot of video games. I want to play a lot of different <laughs> stuff. And, um, you know, I, I definitely like, um, I like when Steam like really made early access a big thing. That was like a big a moment for me because I like games that feel raw and unfinished and weird. And there's a lot of, a lot of that stuff on Steam. And I, I think that's really cool. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's going away. Uh, but but uh, I want a place where a developer like Arcane can just feel like it can make the immersive sim it wants to make and not necessarily have to worry about trying to convince people to pay $60 for that game. Cause that seems like a very, a, t- a tall task, but if it's all, if it's there on a service and people can just download it and try it, I, I am excited about the possibility of a lot of people finding games. They had no idea that they liked to me. This, this is like a really a huge potential. And I think that Microsoft is really nailing a lot of these things in terms of delivering on that, that promise. Uh, they seem to fully understand uh, what what that what that future looks like, and I and I, and I will say the other side of it. And again, we talked about this, but it does seem like the tide is turning toward a belief in video games from the people who control mm-hmm. this industry. I think that you know maybe not Bobby Kotick, like you know putting t- taking vicarious visions and throwing it inside a blizzard. That feels a little bit like going yes. the wrong direction. Yeah. But, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, but that that to me that feels like the wrong direction. But it does feel like if the people like that made Titanfall and Titanfall Two are kind of going into leadership positions at EA, uh, which it seems like that's what's happening. Uh, that is a good sign. Yeah. I think oh, yeah. some, of the, some of the smartest minds that have ever made a video game ever uh, being, giving, being given like a lot of money and a lot of oversight of the processes that go into making games at a big company like EA. I think we are moving in the right direction. And I, I'm hoping it all comes together as my kids come to come into gaming and uh, they can say, okay, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff ha- coming from these big publishers. There is a huge thriving indie scene and uh, you know, all kinds of weird stuff happening on Steam. Uh, I can even go on Roblox and find really weird kind of sort of uh, yeah. fun crap on, <laughs> yeah. on Roblox, but like experimental stuff that like, you know, and just try all kinds of different things. 
Um, I just wanted to have a smorgasbord of different experiences, not just the next live service game, which, you know, I love live service games, but I don't want that to be like the only thing. And it, it seems like we are getting over what what was a growing pain, a, 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 like a couple years of like growing pains of, you know, games were created by a couple of people and, and, you know, and was developed by, you know, at most 15 people and cost us a little bit of money. Uh, but in the grand scheme, grand scheme of things, not that much money. So it was all reasonable and manageable. And then all of a sudden games would cost a ton of money and all of the risk was put in front of these people and they just couldn't believe how risky it was to make another video game. And they had to get creative about managing that risk and assessing that risk and feeling good about that risk. And I think we are coming out on the other side of that right now. And the future is going to be pretty good, pretty good. I think we're going to get a lot of cool games out of Game Pass and other similar sort of efforts. And I'm very excited about that. Awesome. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. love that. All right, let's go into our outro here. Again, Jeff, thank you. Upcoming reviews. We're going to be reviewing Immortals Phoenix Rising, Wreckfest, and No Man's Sky. Some of these are a little late, obviously, but we're just getting to them now. Uh, let us know if there's any games out there you'd like us to review. We're open to anything. Uh, Ryan's still exploring the idea of playing a JRPG, so we'll, we'll get to that. I'm warming up to it. We'll, yeah, you'll get there. Final Fantasy. We'll get there. That's kind of where I draw the line. You can contact us on Twitter at Bush League GMNG, at Bush League Ryan, at Nick A. Beard. Uh, email us at Bush League Games at gmail.com. Patreon's patreon.com slash Bush League Gaming, and you can buy some merch on our store, Bush League slash store. Jeff, one more plug. Where can people find you? Where can they support you at? Let them know. Yeah, uh, just give me on Twitter uh, at Jeff Grubb. Uh, no space, nothing like that. Two B's in Grubb. Uh, and then if you want, uh, you can find my discord there and once you're in the discord there's links to everything i just come out hang on my discord talk about games there's a lot of people there uh you could just come and lurk or come reach out to me there and have like a you know a more intimate conversation than you would on twitter uh that you're, you're more than welcome to join me there as well so yeah and guys thanks for having me on this was a really insightful conversation i appreciate it appreciate it jeff we appreciate yeah, you thank yeah you. thank awesome, you jeff. and uh we'll see you next week i love you see ya cold cash man cold cash